And so appendicitis is just simply defined as an inflammation of the inner lining of the variform appendix that is spread to other parts of it. Uh, and it develops when the neck of the appendix becomes blocked by fecal lip or by post inflammatory scarring that creates a closed loop and obstruction within the organism. And despite diagnostic and therapeutic advancement in medicine, appendicitis remains a clinical emergency and is one of the most common causes for acute abdominal pain today. And what we'll find though is that not all acute abdominal pain is appendicitis. That's, that also needs to be said. So, we see that appendicitis is one of the more common surgical emergencies in the United States and is one of the most common causes of abdominal pain. In the U.S., there are around 250,000 cases of appendicitis, representing 1 million patient days of admission per year. Appendicitis occurs in 7% of the population, with an incidence rate of 1.1 cases per 1,000 people per year. We see that it is lower in cultures that have a high fiber diet, which the high fiber diet seems to increase the viscosity of feces a decreased bowel transit times and discourages formation of fecal lips. And we also see that the median age of appendectomy is around 22 years. But we get into staggering statistic as well. Statistics report that one in five cases of appendicitis is misdiagnosed. And a normal appendix is found in 15 to 40 percent of all patients who have emergency appendectomy. And so what that means is that not everybody who presents as appendicitis actually does have appendicitis. And so that it's, it has a high probability of being misdiagnosed. But the most common cause of luminal obstruction, which will develop into appendicitis is lymphoid hyperplasia secondary to inflammatory bowel disease, common in childhood and young adults. We also see that fecal stasis and fecal lids in elderly patients. Fecal lids form when calcium salts and fecal debris become layered around a nidus of insipated fecal material located in the appendix. We also see that parasites can cause it as well. And one of the big clues to finding the appendix on CT in elderly patients, and not even just elderly patients, but people who are middle aged and a little older is the presence of fecal lids. Fecal lids are an excellent indicator of where the appendix is because a lot of times the appendix is not seen. When you're scanning through the patient and you see the abdomen and you're going into the pelvis in the right little quadrant, there are several things that mirror the appendix and if you don't look at it correctly, if you don't see the correct things, then you never know if this patient has appendicitis. A lot of times you're looking for fecal lids, straining and things like that that will indicate the inflammation of the appendix. So we see that the associated symptoms, uh, the classic history of anorexia and prayer umbilical pain followed by nausea, right little quadrant pain and vomiting occur only in 50% of cases. And so that means that a lot of the time your patients will not present with this. You will not have you know, the typical signs that will say this person has appendicitis. We also see that nausea is present in around 61 to 92% of patients. Anorexia is present in 74 to 78 percent of patients. Uh, one of uh, our general surgeons, he said that uh, most of the time patients who have appendicitis don't normally throw up. Most of the time you will never see someone who throw up. And so if you see someone who has appendicitis, then they probably have not thrown up. And that's a good indicator. But we see that that's not always the gold standard as well. Just like right lower quadrant pain, is not the gold standard. Uh, we see that vomiting that precedes pain is suggestive of an intestinal obstruction. So there we go. Uh, the most common symptom of appendicitis is just simple abdominal pain. Uh, we also see that symptoms begin as peri-umbilical or epigastric pain migrating to the right lower quadrant. And we see this when patients usually lie down, flex their hips, and draw their knees up to reduce the movements. This will be an excellent indicator of attempting to avoid the pain of appendicitis. We 
also see that the duration of symptoms is less than 48 hours in approximately 80% of adults, but tends to be longer in elderly persons and in those with perforations. So how do you diagnose appendicitis? Uh, it generally starts with lab work. CDC studies consistently show that 80 to 85% of adults with appendicitis have an elevated white blood count greater than 10,500. Uh, less than 4% of patients with appendicitis have a white blood cell count of less than 10,500. And so we see that a CBC is a pretty good indicator of an inflammation, an inflammatory process occurring in the body. However, we also see that C reactive protein, CRP as a lot of people call it, is an acute phase reactant synthesized by the liver in response to an infection or an inflammation and rapidly increases within the first 12 hours. And so we see that it is a very, very indicative result and a test to see that an infection is actually going on. However, we also see that it can't distinguish where this infection is in the body. And we also see that a urinary beta HCG, a pregnancy test, should be ordered to rule out ectopic pregnancy because of the pain and the symptoms that can go on with it. We also see that CT apicoas, uh, studies have demonstrated that CT has a high sensitivity around 98 to 98.5% of accurately diagnosing acute appendicitis. We also see that ultrasound has gained some prominence in terms of being the modality to demonstrate appendicitis, simply because of the radiation concerns. In people who are uh, very young, ultrasound seems to be something that people are starting to gravitate towards. However, uh, they say that it cannot actually rule out appendicitis. To rule out appendicitis, you have to do a CT. And this is because in ultrasound, the normal appendix cannot be seen. If you see an appendix on the ultrasound, you probably have appendicitis, but that shouldn't be verified with CT. So if you look at a CT, what you will probably see to diagnose uh, an appendicitis is that you should see a distended appendix greater than six millimeters in diameter uh, with thickened walls that enhance and straining in the right lower quarter uh, in elderly patients or middle-aged patients or even uh, some less than middle-aged mm. could possibly see an appendic lift or fecal lift uh, which will verify that the structure that you're actually looking at is the appendix. However, as it says, they are not always present so you can't rely on that always being there see it in the size, you have to know what the pen size actually looks like and what the patient's symptoms are to find out whether the patient has a pen size. And so here is actually a, what the pen size actually looks like. And if we see here, we have some inflammation going on. And then the bowel, the walls of the appendix are kind of thick. They're thicker than what they normally would be. And if you measure this, I'm sure this would be greater probably nine or 10 millimeters in diameter for this person. So this person probably has acute appendicitis. But one of the keys here is that you see the straining, you see the inflammation process, but you don't see a fecal lift. And I'm sure this person is not a small child, just based on the body cavities. And so this is just an amazing mm -hmm. indicator that you cannot rely demonstrate this. Here's an axial image of an appendicitis, and uh, I'm not sure whether you all have actually went over it in your, some of your classes, but this is really a very good indicator of what appendicitis looks like in CT. On your axial images, you'll see a structure, and you'll have a ring around it. And this ring is the contrast that has actually went towards it is contrasting and so it's highlighting because of the inflammatory process and it's standing out from all your other tissues. Here's an 
another example of appendicitis, and this person actually does have an uh, appendicle in, appendicle is something there. However, the contrast is actually not gotten into the appendix. But as you can see, this person does have some string going in alongside of the appendix. It looks a little bit hazy, and it is extremely dilated. You know, if you simply looked at that and didn't know what you were looking at, you could almost say that that is a part of a small bowel, just simply because of the dilation that is occurring. Uh, however, that is an appendix. And so this person probably has a fever, a very elevated blood count. Uh, and this is probably one that is in danger of rupture, just simply because it is so dilated. However, we don't see any free air, we don't see anything going on, so possibly the patient won't have a perforated appendix when they actually get in. Here is another demonstration of appendicitis, and it is one of the more difficult ones to pick out. If you didn't have the arrow there, it would probably be extremely difficult. But this structure here with the air bubble in it is the appendix. And just based on the diameter of it, and the diameter is what you will have you would have to go by. If the diameter is greater than six millimeters, then you must say the patient has an enlarged or dilated appendix. And so this person probably has a very large appendix as well. And what this other arrow is actually pointing towards, this is all of the stream probably patient could be getting ready to rupture and develop an abscess, but that is the straining that it is pointing towards, that is leading you towards the appendix. But once again, the appendix is one of those structures that is extremely difficult to pick out, just simply because there are other things that mirror it. But this is the best indication of appendicitis that we have. That, that's the one that classic case of appendicitis looks like that would be it. That would be what I would highlight and learn from. So does anyone have any questions about appendicitis? Okay. So Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is simply the idiopathic chronic transmural inflammatory process of the bowel that involves that often leads to fibrosis and obstructive symptoms and can affect any part of the gastrointestinal tract from the mouth to the anus. And so that is something that you want to key in on that it can affect any part of the gastrointestinal tract from the mouth to the anus. So simply, it doesn't have to occur in one spot. It doesn't have to go in small bowel. It doesn't have to go in large bowel. It can go anywhere. It can be found anywhere. A lot of times we kind of relegate it into the small bowel, going into the large bowel, things like that, but that doesn't have to be what Crohn's is. Crohn's can be anywhere. And so we see that this condition is believed to result from an imbalance between pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory mediators. And that approximately 30% of Crohn's disease cases involve the small bowel, particularly terminal ileum. Another 30% involve only the colon, and 40% Involve both the small bowel and colon. So we see here that it is a very diverse disease. It can go anywhere. It can be manifested. We see that the granulomas and inflammatory process in Crohn's disease is frequently discontinuous with disease segments of bowel separated by apparent healthy sections of bowel. And these are called skip lesions. So that is another important quality of Crohn's disease that you need to remember, is that Crohn's disease is manifested not as a continuous segment, but as a segment that of infected bowel as well as normal bowel. And so you'll see these areas that normal bowel occurs in, and that is called skip lesions. And so the clinical spectrum of Crohn's disease is broad, ranging from relatively benign course with unpredictable acute attacks in remissions to severe diarrhea in acute condition in the abdomen. And we see that most cases begin before age 30, 
and approximately 20 to 30 percent of all patients with Crohn's disease are diagnosed before age 20. And so we see that most patients are diagnosed at a very young age and it's something that they have to live with for the rest of their lives that will affect all of their lives. And we see that the prevalence of Crohn's disease in the United States is approximately seven cases per 100,000 in the population. So while appendicitis was 1.1 per 1,000, this is seven cases per 100,000. So this is a lesser known disease. So the causes of Crohn's disease are really unknown. Uh, but they believe that genetic, microbial, and immunological, environmental, dietary, and vascular things can all cause it. And another big one is psychosocial factors. This is such as smoking, oral contraceptives, NSAIDs, stress, things like that, they think could contribute to the prevalence of Crohn's disease. And so we also see that smoking has been demonstrated to double the risk of Crohn's disease. So basically, smoking is one of those psychosocial things that can really affect whether you develop Crohn's disease or not, or can predispose you to a greater incident we also see that there is a strong correlation for a genetic predisposition suggesting inheritance. And so they think that there is a Mendelian inheritance uh, or Mendelian genetic disposition for people to get Crohn's disease. So basically, if someone in your family has Crohn's disease, that makes you more predisposed to getting Crohn's disease yourself. However, the big thing is they really don't know what causes. We see that symptoms of Crohn's disease are diffuse abdominal tenderness, severe diarrhea, blood in stool, and one of the more important things, right lower quadrant pain, mimicking that of appendicitis. And so, not everyone that comes in with right lower quadrant pain does have appendicitis, you know, because there are other things that affect the right lower quadrant as well. So, the workup for diagnosis is just CBC, metabolic panel, stool sample, CT admin pelvis, MRI, ultrasound, colonoscopy. So you have a wide gamut of typical tests that can be run diagnosed. However, the CT demonstration is a circumferential thickening of the bowel wall. Thickening is most often one to two centimeters, but can be up to three centimeters. So we see that the bowel wall can be very, very thick. Another thing to key in on is the presence of skip lesions. That will really be a very important thing to note because the skip lesions will help you demonstrate Crohn's disease and tell it from colitis. We also see that fistulas and sinus tracts between bowel loops or to the bladder or to adjacent muscle or to the skin surface are all characteristics of Crohn's disease. So if you see something that has a fistula or a sinus tract, then you can say that that's probably Crohn's disease. That is one of the ways uh, that Crohn's is manifested. So if we look here, we see that we have what you can basically say is a skip lesion. You see this part of the bowel and you see the contrast actually going through it, but notice how thick the walls are. The walls are extremely thick on it. And you see large portions of unaffected bowel. These walls are not thick. These are not thick. And if it was colitis, you would see it all being in one continuous thing. So if this was thick, this was thick, everything in between it would be thick as well. However, you see here that another portion of the bowel has thickness and it is extremely thick. You know, when you're thinking about that, that's several centimeters thick. And so you have the presence of thickening of the bowel wall, probably an elevated white blood count, and also skip lesions. So you can say that this person probably has Crohn's disease. Another example is this. You see this portion of the bowel, and it has thickness 
on the posterior section of it. And then, if you trace this and you go all the way out, you see that none of this has thickness. None of it actually exhibits the thickness. But if you get over here, you see, once again, thickness. And even here, this is creating a very large stenosis here where there's not much contrast that is actually moving through because of the thickness of the bowel wall. And so you have the presence of skip lesions and the presence of normal bowel. And that is the big thing upon distinguishing Crohn's disease. That is the biggest thing that you can do or notice to see Crohn's disease. So does anyone have any questions about those? So we'll get into colitis. And so we see that colitis is just like Crohn's disease and inflammation of the colon. It can be associated with enteritis, which is inflammation of the intestine, and or proctitis, inflammation of the rectum. And it is one of two diseases, disease processes labeled as inflammatory bowel disease, with the other being Crohn's disease. So if you put both Crohn's disease and colitis under a heading, it would be inflammatory bowel disease. And they are, these are the two demonstrations of inflammatory bowel disease. So we see that there are different types of Crohn's disease, uh, or colitis, and we won't really focus on these very much because of our time constraints. But just know that these are out there, these types do exist. And if you really want to focus in on some of them, the ones to focus in on are ulcerative colitis, Crohn's colitis, and um, top colitis, and ischemic colitis. Those are probably the four that you need to focus in on. And just know that toxic megacolon is a complication of colitis. And if you don't watch it, it can turn dead. So we see that colitis can be caused by acute infections, hypersensitivity to various allergens, ischemia, and vasculitis. So they, they seem to have a better handle on what actually causes colitis in relation to Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is a little bit more up in the air. And so we see that associated symptoms of colitis are abdominal distension, tenderness, blood and mucus in the stool, and diarrhea with blood in the stool. So if you went on the first two, abdominal distension and tenderness, it would almost mirror that of a large bowel obstruction. However, when you get to blood with mucus in the stool and diarrhea with blood in the stool, then that becomes more distinguishable between colitis and an obstruction. So lab test can be ordered, and we see that a CRP level, which as we saw with appendicitis, demonstrates an infection in the body. It is elevated in 90% of the cases. Also metabolic panel, CT admin pelvis, and an MRI. And we see that there's different manifestations of it on CT. We see that bowel wall on parole strip colitis, bowel wall thickening with lumen narrowing. Uh, the thickening is usually in the range of 7 to 8 millimeters. So that is something to remember for ulcerative colitis. It's 7 to 8 millimeters. Crohn's colitis, bowel wall thickening, 10 to 20 millimeters. A pseudomembranous colitis, thickening can be up to 30 millimeters. Hyphalitis, wall thickening, 10 to 30 millimeters. Ischemic colitis, mild to moderate circumferential thickening, and toxic megacolon, which is not a type of colitis, but it is a symptom of colitis. It can cause dilation of the colon greater than five centimeters, which can then cause thinning of the colon wall, pneumatosis, and perforation. So toxic megacolon is just that it can lead to a very toxic condition within the body that will create sepsis and possible death. So here's what actually Crohn's uh, colitis looks like. Uh, as you can see, it 
this image is not the greatest. All you can see is that you have a foul wall thicken. But there is really nothing that distinguishes this between it and Crohn's disease on this image. So this would be one of those images that we would not put on the test, simply because it would be hard to distinguish. I couldn't put this on the test and say, which is this, Crohn's or Plots, because there's not enough information here, or what is this. Because there's not really, when I was looking on the internet, there's not that many images of colitis. All I can tell you in terms of colitis, if I did put an image on there, what it would be is you would see thickening here, and you would see it on the cross. And so there would be no skip lesions. That's the thing that you have to get about colitis is colitis has no skip lesions, whereas Crohn's does. They're both inflammatory processes. They're different types of colitis. But in the end, they all thicken the wall of the bowel simply because of the inflammatory process. But the thing that distinguishes them is skip lesions. And to make things just a little simpler, these are the four important things that you really need to remember about the two. And so Crohn's disease, in terms of location, can be in the entire digestive tract, whereas colitis is only found in the large bowel. Pain location, they're the exact opposite. Crohn's disease is right lower quadrant, and colitis is left lower quadrant. So Crohn's disease mimics appendicitis, whereas colitis really does. Manifestation, Crohn's disease is patchy areas with skip lesions, meaning that it can appear in one section and not at another section. Whereas colitis, it will be continuous with no skip lesions, meaning that at the, the origin of it, it will continue going. And the complications of Crohn's disease are fistulas and strictures. So if you see someone who has thickened bowel wall with fistulas or passageways between two adjacent sections of bowel, then you can say that it's probably Crohn's disease. Whereas if you see thickened bowel wall, but there's no stricture, no difficulty in passing materials through, that's probably indicative of colitis. And so that is just simply those two conditions. And this is, for the most part, this is what you really need to know about how to distinguish those. So we move into esophageal carcinoma. Simply stated, this is esophageal cancer. And it's uh, in the U.S. for the year 2008, the American Cancer Society estimated that 16,470 new cases, which would equal out to 12,970 men and 3,500 women, would be diagnosed with esophageal cancer. With 14,280 expected to die the disease. So you can see that it has a very poor prognosis. And that is demonstrated by the mortality rate being around 87%. And the incidence is far higher in men than women. And so if you boil it all down, what simply causes esophageal carcinoma has been found to be cigarette smoke, excessive alcohol intake, and the interesting thing here is they study the cases. And for people who drunk more than 30 grams of alcohol per day, when compared to those who didn't, there was a four to one ratio of developing esophageal carcinoma. So drink, the more you drink, the more your incidence of developing uh, esophageal carcinoma goes. And another interesting study is for people who didn't drink more than 15 grams of alcohol per day and they smoked, when compared to those who didn't, there is an 8 to 1 ratio. So alcohol consumption coupled with smoking equals a very high probability that you could develop esophageal carcinoma. And another interesting thing is the human papilloma virus has been found to actually cause esophageal carcinoma. So the symptoms are dysphagia, weight loss, which occurs in more than 50% of the patients, 
a pain or pressure in the epigastric or retrosternal area, hoarseness and cough. And a big one, a big symptom there is dysphagia and hoarseness because you can really you can see that manifested. The weight loss can be associated with other types of cancer. However, dysphagia and hoarseness are really prime indicators of esophageal carcinoma. And we see that lab tests are usually not ordered simply because they do not have an ability to diagnose it. Uh, we see that a barium swallow can be ordered, endoscopic ultrasound, bronchoscopy, and a CT neck chest. And that is simply used to assess the extent of the disease and to identify those patients whom they can actually have surgery and be resected and those who can. And so this is actually what an endoscopic uh, study looks like. And as you can see here, uh, this little area here is part of uh, the cancer. And I believe this is actually a video. Or not. It may not actually play. Oh well. Uh, but it was part of the endoscopic study and you can actually see what the tumor looks like and it's very very interesting to see and so we see that if you're looking at it on CT uh, this the manifestation of esophageal carcinoma is just an irregular thickening of the wall of the esophagus more than three millimeters and that intraluminal polypoid mass can be seen and that would go into the image that we just saw. You actually can see the mass, and it looks like a polyp. You hear uh, when people are doing colonoscopies that they have polyps in their large intestine, and they have those polyps removed and biopsied and things like that. Well, polyps, uh, as we'll see, can be in the large intestine, but we have a polypoid mass here as well, and it looks just like a polyp. And it is actually part of the carcinoma. We also see that dilatation of the esophagus above the arrow, uh, area of narrowing. So the area above the stenosis is actually very, very dilated, attempting to compensate, but it really cannot compensate because of the stricture. And so here is what it actually looks like on CT. Uh, most of the time, you'll see your esophagus running on the back side of the heart, and next, almost next to the aorta. And if you see here, this is actually a mass. And mass has got contrast in it. And probably this is the actual opening of the esophagus with everything being constrained around it. So this person will not be able to swallow very much. Has a very, very difficult time probably eating. Uh, may even have a difficult time talking. Things like that are very difficult. And the primary Suspicion of this is just the thickening of the wall. So if you say that this is the actual opening of this office, this is the wall, and it's constricting the heart. And so that is the classic symptom manifestation of esophageal carcinoma. We also see here that here is the esophagus, and this person has got a mass, and this is the upper portion of the esophagus. And this mass is actually confined it down to this portion being the only opening of the esophagus. And this is an entire mass here with this opening. And you can see how much of a stenosis it is actually placing on the patient. Probably making it very difficult. Once again, talk and to swallow. Here's another example. And once again, to look for the esophagus, just look behind the heart next to the aorta and you should see the esophagus. That will be the key way of seeing the esophagus. And you'll see on a typical normal patient, the area should be nice and wide. It should be really wide. However, this person is not a typical patient. And here is the actual opening of the esophagus. It's very much like a pinhole and everything else is collapsing around it. So this person, once again, difficulty in swallowing simply because of the small nature of this this.
So does anyone have any questions about that? We'll go to gastric carcinoma or stomach cancer. And we see that gastric cancer was once the second most common cancer in the world. Uh, in most developed countries, however, rates of stomach cancer have been decreasing over the past half century. Uh, in the United States, stomach malignancy is currently the 14th most common cancer. Just, however, just simply because it's the 14th most common cancer doesn't mean that it's any less dangerous. Stomach cancer is quite, quite dangerous. Uh, and we see that decreases in stomach cancer have actually been attributed in part to widespread use of refrigeration, which has led several to several beneficial effects, increased consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables, decreased salt intake, uh, which have been used as food preservation, and decreased contamination of foods by carcinogens. And so we see that because of advances in refrigeration and uh, our attempts to consume healthier foods, that part of uh, gastric cancer has reduced. However, that doesn't mean that it has been eradicated. We see that even patients who present in the most favorable conditions and who undergo curative surgical resection often die of recurrent disease. So that just means that even though they think that they have got it, most of the time they really have. And it comes back and people actually uh, have a greater chance of dying from recurrent disease. And so the site of the stomach cancer is classified on the basis of its relationship to the long axis of the stomach. Approximately 60 or 40 percent of cancers develop in the lower part, 40 percent in the middle part, and 15 percent in the upper part. 10 percent involve more than one part of the organ. And the American Cancer Society estimates that 21,130 cases of gastric cancer would be diagnosed in 2009, and that 10,620 would die of the disease. And so, pretty much about a 50% chance of actually making it out of the disease. And we see that the five year survival rate for curative surgical resection ranges from 30 to 50% for patients with stage 2 disease and from 10 to 25% for patients with stage 3 disease. And the operative mortality rate for patients undergoing curative surgical resection at major academic centers is less than 3%. Gastric carcinoma is very high in Japan, Chile, and parts of Eastern Europe. And we see that probably the reason for that is that it is assumed that the factors that lead to it are multiple factors. But we see that a diet rich in pickled vegetables, salted fish, smoked meats, correlate with a greater risk. And so it's probable that these areas overseas actually have a high diet in salt. And so because of this, they have an increased risk of gastric carcinoma. We also see high vitamin C may have a protective effect against gastric once again, we see smoking. H. pylori is another big one. We also see previous gastric surgery, which cannot possibly alter the normal pH of the stomach. And when you alter the normal pH of the stomach, you can allow bacteria possibly to flourish, food to go undigested, and this can lead to problems with the gastric uh, And another interesting thing is a chlorohydra, which is absence of hydrochloric acid into the stomach, which means that, once again, your stomach does not uh, function as properly as it should be, and because of that, you actually can develop this. When you say the uh, previous surgeries, is that like the one where they uh, make the stomach smaller for losing weight? S stuff like that can actually, <laughs> actually contribute to it, uh, because uh, it, goes, it goes back to the so you're altering what, what it was actually supposed to be and designed to be effective to something that's less effective. And because of that, uh, bad things can happen. And 
And so the reason stomach cancer is so deadly is simply because of the associated symptoms. Uh, we see early disease actually has no symptoms. So most of the time when people get diagnosed with stage one, stage two stomach cancer, it's actually an incidental finding. And they didn't actually go in because they were having any symptoms of stomach cancer. They were having symptoms of something else. And because of those symptoms, they actually were found out to have gastric carcinoma. However, most of the time, you don't develop symptoms until you have advanced diseases. And this is what makes it so deadly. You, in advanced disease, you have indigestion, nausea, vomiting, dysphagia, uh, postprandial fullness, loss of appetite, millennia, uh, hemodiamesis, and weight loss. And so by the time that you actually see these symptoms manifested, it has probably gone out of control. So you're having stage three and possibly even stage four. So that is why it is so imperative uh, that you watch your diet, because it seems that diet has a predisposition to develop Lab test, uh, CBC, and cancer antigen. However, we see that the cancer antigen is a very misleading test and that it's only elevated in 20% of cases. And probably, if you look even further, a lot of those 20% of cases are elevated and they're not actually uh, people that have cancer because the cancer antigen is one of those tests that creates a lot of false positives and false negatives. So it has a very high prevalence of being false positive, meaning that it says that you have cancer and you don't. And then it has, on the swing side of it, false negatives, where it says that you don't have anything and you actually do. And so it's a very misleading test. We also see that in the EGD, uh, chest X-ray to evaluate four METs, and CT chest abdomen pelvis to catch anything that's possibly metastatic as well as some cancer itself uh, is very helpful in MRI. So looking at CT, we see that uh, the primary tumor appears as a focal, nodular, irregular thickening of the gastric wall. And that diffuse wall thickening and narrowing of the lumen is also demonstrated. And we see that there are stages of this. So stage one, you have intraluminal mass without wall thickening. Stage two, you have wall thickening greater than one centimeter without invasion of other tissues. Stage three, you have wall thickening with invasion in other organs. And so that's what separates stage two <coughs> and stage three. What makes it stage one and stage two less deadly and what makes stage three and four more deadly simply because they invade the other organs and they go all over. Stage four then is obliteration of fat planes that cover the stomach. So basically your stomach has just become one large mass and there's nothing that was covered. And we'll actually see that in one of the images. Here is an example of uh, gastric carcinoma. And what kind of clues you in here is that you see most of the stomach and the stomach looks nice and full. And you could probably say that this is a little thick here at the wall. But what really clues you in portions of the stomach, you see that there is a very large stenosis there. And this air is just, it's really narrow. And because of that, there's a mass probably on both sides of the stomach that is causing. That is what will really put you in. Uh, a lot of times, uh, we, we I've, I think I've scanned several patients with stomach cancer, and uh, I, I saw them where six months prior, no manifestation, there was nothing that exhibited on the CT, and then you come back after they've had further diagnostic work done, and their stomach wall has been just huge, just thick. And that's that's the key, just thickness of the stomach wall. If you see a stomach and it's got just a very, just very small wall and everything else, if you see with contrast, oil contrast, and the stomach is totally full, there's just this little bit tiny wall, and the person doesn't have anything wrong with the stomach. But when you see a stenosis, it's things like that, and big thickness on the wall, that is a very good indicator. And so here we see another type. And if you'll notice here, this is what I'm talking about, a thin wall stomach. You see up here where there's 
minimal wall thickness, there's not much. That is what a normal stone would look like. There's nothing that distinguishes it. However, this inside the stomach does distinguish. This is not undigested food. This is not anything other than a mass in the stomach. And the reason you can say that it's a mass in the stomach is because the patient hasn't been given oral contrast. That's number one. And you have injected the patient with contrast. And because you've injected the patient with contrast, cancers usually have a high density, a high rate of becoming uh, contrasted. And when they become contrasted, they just jump out. And so this has actually become contrasted because of the increased blood flow to the area. And it is standing out from all the contents of the stuff. And so what you see in the stomach is probably normal fluid, air, and then something else. And so you probably said this is a metastatic, not a metastatic, but a primary carcinoma. And this is uh, the stomach that has obliteration of flat of fat points. And basically this whole thing is the stomach, but it is one giant just area of cancer. You can look at the bowel wall, the bowel wall is huge. It's thick everywhere. There's very little portion of the stomach. This person probably, um, you know, stage four, and uh, if you actually stand up and did some on the chest, and did some, then you actually got to see more of the liver, you'll probably see metastatic lesions all throughout the person's body simply because it has invaded everything. And so this person has a very, very poor prognosis. Uh, but you can see the actual inner portion of the stomach is very small. So probably when this person, if they actually do have the ability to eat and tolerate things, probably it doesn't take much to fill them up because there's not much there to actually have to fill. And so this is a more severe case of gastric carcinoma, and it's pretty easy to see. Does anybody have any questions about that? That's why, that's why they would experience the weight loss. go to colon cancer and we will just look at the description and then we'll go to uh, the CT manifestation since we're running a little low on time. And uh, carcinoma of the colon and the rectum is the third leading cause of death from cancer in the United States. About half of the colon carcinomas occur in the rectum and sigmoid, uh, where they can be felt by rectal examination or seen with sigmoidoscope. And colon cancer spreads by direct extension with the penetration of the colon wall, lymphatic drainage to regional nodes, hematogenesis roots, to the portal veins to the liver, and the interperitoneal CD. And so, um, just one of the things to talk about on the causes uh, familial uh, polyposis. Uh, it's a hereditary disease in which innumerable polyps develop in the colon and elsewhere in the intestinal tract, uh, and also just polyps in general. People who have a colonoscopy and they say uh, they hear that they have polyps in, in the intestine, and that is something to watch for. And so the CT manifestation. So the primary tumor may be a colon polyp. Uh, these are nearly always larger than one centimeter. Uh, most cancers appear as soft tissue densities that narrow the lumen of the colon. And so I know you guys have heard about apple core lesions. Uh, and that's, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, apple core lesions demonstrate a regular bulky circumferential wall thickening with mark and a regular narrowing of the bowel lumen simply stated that they cut off the passageway to create a very, very strict uh, type of stenosis. And you also see regional lymph nodes larger than one centimeter are considered 
positive for metastatic diseases. And so here is what a colon cancer would look like. Now, I apologize for the brain cancer. This is probably not on a, a multi-detector uh, scanner, but this is probably on one of the older scanners where it's more uh, difficult to do a chrome image. But you get the general picture here. You have large intestine coming through, and you have a very high stenosis here. And this is probably for an apple core leading simply because it looks like an apple core. Uh, it creates a very tight passageway. And as you can see here, this would be a reason that someone would have a large bowel obstruction because it's creating something to where if you have a large influx of things in your colon, it cannot be excreted as fast as you are consuming. So you can have a bowel obstruction. Here is another mass in the colon. And this one is not as prevalent as what you just saw, but you can still see that the lumen is narrow, and so there's not as much of a passageway in it, but there is this mass on the inside of it. Your bowel should look like this. It should look like this, this, this. It should look nice and open, however, this one does not. And so any time that you see something like this in it, it would be a good indicator. And while we're talking about that, have, have you all saw um, what virtual endoscopy looks like? Never have? Well, that is gaining some prevalence on CT now. Uh, basically, what you do is it's like a barium enema, however, you don't inject. You don't do it in contrast, you do it in there. And what it does is it distends the intestines out. And so instead of doing an colonoscopy where you do uh, where you actually have a physician doing it, you can do it with a scanner. And it's it's gaining a lot of prevalence simply because it looks like that. And so you can travel the intestines and you can look at polyps, you can measure things, you can see all of the passageways. It is a very, very interesting thing that has caught on and it's only because we have uh, <coughs> had multi-detector scanners developed, which can acquire images from all different planes, and we can have this. But it's it's catching on. The only downside of it is that you <coughs> can't actually remove the polyps and do a biopsy. And so, if you see someone who has polyps, they're still going to have to have uh, colonoscopy to have the biopsy of the polyps. So, in some ways, it's more effective if you want to do it really quick to find out what's going on. In other ways. But there are sections in your book uh, in the fundamentals of body CT that covers it. And so uh, just take a look at it. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, metastatic diseases, uh, meds to bowel are rare and almost impossible to differentiate from primary tumors. So one thing is that in the test, I will never say distinguish between primary and metastatic disease of the cold because it's virtually nothing that separates the primary from the meds. However, know that a lot of the times meds to the bowel are from melanoma and renal cell carcinoma. And so we see that abdominal tumors are very, very rare. 4% of all intestinal tumors account for them. 75% of all small bowel tumors are benign. The most common benign tumor in the small bowel is allelomyoma, which typically involves the genome. Uh, the most common benign tumor of the colon are adenomas or polyps and lipomas. The risk of malignant transformation in the adenomas or polyps depends on the size and histology of the polyp. Polyps greater than one centimeter in size have a higher risk of malignancy. And so here is what a polyp looks like. If you see this area here, and you see an area here, those are polyps. That is something that is going on inside of the intestinal wall that is not normal or normal structure or anything. However, based on the size, you would probably say that that is nothing to worry about because they're probably not over one centimeter in size. However, this 
something that you would like to keep a watch on and go from there if they rapidly increase in size. And here is what polyps actually look like from a colonoscopy. You see that based on the location, it is uh, almost ready to go into the transverse colon. And these are just the polyps here. Just little soft tissue masses in the colon. However, they probably would be biopsied to see whether they're in danger of becoming malignant or not. And lastly, abdominal trauma. Uh, there's this whole entire section in the book devoted to abdominal trauma. And uh, basically what I want you to know about it is injuries to the bowel and mesentery occur in about 5% of patients with blunt abdominal trauma. Uh, accuracy of CT and diagnosis of bowel mesentery injuries are around 77 to 95%, so we have a very good rate of tracking these things down. Uh, patients who are hemodynamically stable are those that are good candidates for CT. So if a person comes in with blunt abdominal trauma and they're not losing blood profusely and they're in relatively stable condition, then they are good candidates for CT. But on the flip side, if someone comes in and they are losing blood rapidly, they're not stable, they need to be took to surgery and had exploratory surgery performed rather than waiting around for CT, waiting around for a report, because that's uh, kind of uh, foolish to do. But just looking at abdominal trauma, uh, this person has free air in the abdominal cavity. It's very hard to detect. Uh, what we typically do for uh, free air, if there's a concern about free air, what we do is you saw the lung windows where it demonstrates like thorax is really well and stuff, well we run that on that and flip it to lung windows and you run through it. And it's not making the patient have another scan, another anything. It's just converting the windows to a different thing. And it really has air stand out. And so anytime that there's risk of a bowel perforation, things like that, lung windows are very, very handy to perform. So this person could have some abdominal trauma simply because he has free air. We also see that this is shock bowel caused by direct uh, abdominal trauma. And what you see here is the lumen is very, very large. It's extremely dilated. And your bowel wall is extremely visible. You shouldn't be able to see it. It looks like you've almost injected contrast uh, into the bowel wall directly simply because of how it stands out. But these are just two examples of it. Your book has tons of it, but uh, as we said, you know, 5% of all patients with blind abdominal trauma present with injury to the gastrointestinal system. So it's not something that you want to see often. But uh, that's just one of those things. Also, I posted a reading list online. I'm sorry for the delay, uh, but it has, it, it's what we need to look at for the gastrointestinal system. Also be mindful to look at some of the images. Uh, some of them, especially the fundamentals of ICT, has some really, really good images in terms of uh, the gastrointestinal system. And so just look at those. If you've got any questions, just let me know. We want to be posting um, a quiz for the gastrointestinal system probably Thursday, and it will run until next Thursday. Um, and it'll be just like our test. You can start, stop it. There will be 20 questions on it um, for a grade of 100.